Of PLOS, um, so uh, please welcome uh, Nicola Steed, and who's a senior editor of PLOS. Um, and PLOS is our open access publisher that is start in San, San Francisco is the main office, but we have an office right here in Cambridge. <laughs> yes, very close. Well, thank you very much for for having us. Uh, it's great to be uh, celebrating Open Access Week uh, to the tenth year now. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about PLOS, um, a little bit about what open science means, and how that can help um, sort of raise uh, awareness and impact of your work. So PLOS was originally started more as an advocacy group. Back in the late 90s, uh, two of our founders based in Stanford, um, Pat Brown and Mac Mike Eisen, were doing microarrays and looking at gene expression. And they wanted to mine the literature to find out more about the genes that they were coming up in their microarrays. And they came across a barrier. Their libraries were telling them that they couldn't mine the data because of copyright. They weren't very happy about this, um, and so teaming up with Harold Varmus from the National Cancer Institute in the US, they created an open letter that basically said, we need research to be made av available, publicly accessible. And so with that, in 2001 PLOS was really sort of founded, Public Library of Science, um, and the aim was to, to really transform research communication. Progress was slow. Um, in 2003, PLOS decided to become a non-profit publisher as well, to sort of lead the way, along with, with other groups such as Biomed Central, to really prove that open access and, and publicly available research could work. And so now we publish seven different journals. All of them are open access. And I think it really is a good opportunity to remind ourselves what open access actually means and, and, what, and why it's so important. So the first thing is that it is, of course, free and immediately accessible. It can anyone, anywhere can access any of the content as long as they have access to the internet. There are no paywalls and no embargoes. But the second aspect of open access is publishing under a CCBY license. So by choosing this model, Authors retain the copyright to their own work, but they license it under a CCBY license. And this means that people are able to reuse and distribute uh, the research as long as the original authors are properly attributed. And this really means that it opens up um, reuse in, in ways that we perhaps didn't think possible. You know, it could be um, the using figures in Wikipedia articles. It could be distributing uh, research articles on online courses that anyone can, can do, whether you're an undergrad or a ge generally interested member of the public. I don't really want to talk too much about our, our different journals. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards at, over lunch. Um, but I did want to highlight PLOS One. Um, I'm an editor at PLOS One, and, and this journal was launched in 2006. And at the time, it really, I think, transformed how we think about publishing scientific research. And we basically sort of had this mission uh, to, to create an inclusive journal for all research, irrespective of the discipline that it came from, and irrespective of the perceived impact or importance of that research. So not judging research on whether it was a hot topic or a sexy topic or new and upcoming, but more on whether it was conducted rigorously, was it ethically done, um, have the methods been described, are the conclusions appropriately supported by the data. And in doing so, we've created a home for all types of research. Uh, so interdisciplinary research finds a home here. We're not sort of um, restricted by what we can consider. Negative results um, can be published. I say unfashionable results. Um, we do see this happen in science. That some areas might uh, be more of a topic at the time. And also, we provide a, a home for reproduction studies. So this is really important in terms of reproducibility, whether a study is able to, to prove that a previous study was correct or refute the findings. And then also, changing the criteria, we can start to 
break this cycle of journal hopping. I, I think possibly a lot of people have experienced this where you submit research to a journal. It may undergo peer review, it might not, depending on that journal's definition of whether it's impactful enough. It goes through peer review and it might get rejected. Then you go to the next journal, same sort of thing might happen. Plus one, we very much feel that impact should be judged after the manuscript has been published. And I will come back to this a bit later. Um, but by doing so, you, you get the research out there quickly and then you can judge the impact and you don't have to go through these journal hopping cycles. I've talked a little bit about you know, open access publication manuscripts, but going back to what I said at the beginning, PLOS One really wants to transform research communication. And traditionally, it has been centered a lot around the journal, the traditional journal article, where you have your introduction, results, methods, um, a discussion. But it is so much more than this. Um, and this is, these are just some um, examples of how we can go beyond the article, how we can really promote open science. And I'm just going to talk about a few of these things today that PLOS are, are working on or, or have implemented. Um, but there is still a lot more uh, to do. So I think one of the first things that's been a big push in terms of open science is data sharing. PLOS has always encouraged authors to make their data available. But in 2014, we felt we needed to do more. And we require now that uh, authors submitting to our journals make all the data underlying the findings and the conclusions in the paper publicly available uh, without restriction. Um, and we ask them to state exactly where that data can be found. Um, and we have only rare exceptions to this rule. There might be cases where there's patient conf confidentiality where we might make an exception to making it publicly available. But then we would ask that it's, it's held in trust in a, a place that other researchers can access um, and, and go to. Why is this important? Um, we think it's important that people can access uh, the results of, of research and, and the data underlying the conclusions. Going back, you know, it's important for uh, replication studies and validation. And this is important to sort of facilitate rep reproducibility. It can also be used for, for new analysis. Um, in my background, d during my PhD, we did a lot of next generation sequencing. And you might be sort of using your data to answer one question, but somebody else could use that to answer another question. And this actually helps get better financial and intellectual returns on, on investment. Um, you know, and you, you get credit for the fact that you were the ones that created the data set as well. So you know, you, you're facilitating. What does this actually look like in practice? This is an example uh, for, from PLOS Biology of a, a data availability statement. So you, it very clearly you can find that you can access the data um, through a public re repository or through um, uh, paid repositories such as Dryad. And we, we encourage people to deposit data in whether it's your institutional repository or whether it's a repository like uh, Dryad or an existing uh, repository such as the GEO um, database. Currently, we now have over 80,000 manuscripts that have been published with a data statement at PLOS. Uh, so really starting to make headways. And so that's something that we've been doing since 2014. I want to talk now a little bit more about uh, two initiatives that we've started in 2017. And the first of this is registered reports. Registered reports have been around for, for quite a while and gaining traction now. And they're really designed to try and combat publication bias. So this is the idea that positive studies are more likely to be uh, published than negative findings. And PLOS One has always supported negative results, but by doing registered reports, it can help uh, authors feel more confident in, in publishing those. And so we've partnered with uh, Children's Tumor Foundation, and through their grant process, uh, we are offering the registered reports. So what this actually turns into is when you submit your grant, you are invited to submit a registered report. 
This report is judged on the research question and the proposed methodology, study design and what analysis you're going to do. At that point, it's reviewed. And if, you know, the, if it's felt to be strong, uh, strong design and the, the research question is valid, um, you get an in-principle acceptance at that point. Then you do your research as normal, following uh, the design you'd, you'd set out in your report. You write up the results in a, a journal article and submit it to PLOS One. Now, when the article comes back to us, we are really looking to see whether you, there has been adherence to the report, the original report. If you said you were going to do this type of analysis, did you do that type of analysis? If not, what was the reason behind that? Because there can always be cases where you just have to change uh, the design as you're going through, but you need to justify why that happened. So we're looking for the quality of the execu execution of the work and the accuracy of the interpretation of the results. And we have a commitment to publish the work irrespective of whether it supports the original hypothesis or not. So if you set out a hypothesis and it is not supported, that's as valid as publishing something that does support the, the hypothesis. And in doing this, we hope that we, we can get a more um, transparent reporting of work, but also combat publication bias. Another really interesting uh, partnership uh, in 2017 has been with protocols.io. So this is an open access repository for protocols um, and science methods. And as you can see here in a data availability statement, um, we have a link out to a protocols.io. And this is what it actually looks like. So researchers can deposit their protocols. You can do this as you're actually doing your research. You can save different versions. So it's very easy to go back and look at how you've changed things over time. Very transparent about what you've done. It means that other people can follow this step by step. In a journal article, you, you often give very high level summaries of what a, a method was, but protocols.io really allow you to have that granular detail. And there is now an app where you can also download it that you can follow step by step. It also includes a helpful thing like a timer. Um, so if there's a step that says incubate for an hour, you can just set that, that you're step 34 and, and then go away and have your coffee. Um, so this really is about improving the reporting in a way that is not necessarily tied to a journal article. Ver as I mentioned before, you can version this. You can send, uh, this has a, a DOI, so you can reference this. You can share your protocols very easily. Um, and it just allows a lot more information than is traditionally included in a journal article. So A little bit like that, yeah, that you can link back to. Um, yeah, you can keep track of everything and, and change it. Yeah, so I think it's probably designed to, to be separate to that. The unit, it's a, a lot easier that you can import this into to your article. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, not everyone has access to that sort of thing, so it's probably online. Moving on, um, another important thing for us is credit. And so this is coming back to this idea of, you know, measuring um, the output of research. And, you know, previously you might have papers where you have one or two people on the article. And it's quite easy to define what someone's individual contribution is. But, you know, as we're growing in numbers of, of research publications, perhaps numbers of authors, there's a lot more collaborative work that, that happens, especially in an interdisciplinary nature. And we really require better mechanisms to credit individual researchers. And so at PLOS, we, along with uh, many uh, publishers, we've uh, adopted the credit taxonomy. We have always encouraged um, contributions to be listed uh, in publications. But by adhering to a specific taxonomy, this can, um, across different publishers, um, it means that we can uh, compare more easily and we're working towards having a machine readable uh, taxonomy that we can, can use. Another thing which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about is ORCID ID. Um, at the moment, uh, we require that all uh, corresponding authors submit with an ORCID ID, um, but we encourage everyone to, to get an ORCID ID. 
Um, at PLOS, uh, we feel that it's important uh, to be able to distinguish different researchers. And we have um, partnered with Crossref that if a paper is accepted at PLOS One and in your ORCID ID um, profile, you've accepted updates from Crossref, it will automatically bring in that piece of, of work into your profile. And the great thing about ORCID ID is it's a unique identifier um, you can keep uh, track of your, your education, your, your work history, um, your publication outputs, all in one place that is visible for everybody uh, to, to view. And what this looks like in practice is, is something like this. You can either hover over the people's names um, and find out this information, but you can clearly see their ORCID ID, clearly very quickly link out to look at their profiles you can very easily see uh, the, the contributions each author has made to the, this manuscript. And then last but not least, I um, want to talk about article level metrics. So this is going back to the, the idea um, that we measure impact after publication. And so this is an example of a paper that was just published eight, on the 18th of October. And I, I really liked this tweet uh, from actually an ex-plant science postdoc um, talking about uh, impact of, of OA. And I think this is a really nice example. It, it got covered by a lot of media outlets, but you can see that people have been going back to the original article. And you know, we've had 324,000, well, more than that, views. That was taken yesterday morning. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting to see people being able to come back. And I think if this was not open access, people wouldn't be actually able to read the article. So having the, the coverage in the news is, is great, but it's also good that people are coming back to the original article. And by having these article level metrics, it's also a way for, for researchers to show impact in, in a way that isn't tied to an impact factor. Um, PLOS is a supporter of the DORA. Um, which we, we strongly discourage the use of, of the impact factor and feel that um, impact should be measured on an article level. Um, and so we provide various different um, outputs. Uh, so at the moment it hasn't been cited because it's only just been published. Um, but you can start to, to dig into to different types of impacts, whether it's impacting public or whether it's impacting the, the scientific community through citations saves, bookmarks through Mendeley, um, shares on, on, on Twitter um, uh, or you know, on Wikipedia, um, which is also a different type of impact. So I think that, that big uh, diagram I had earlier shows that there's a lot of different things that we can be doing uh, to, to promote open science um, and you know, we, we've started working on them. Here are some of the things that I, I personally find quite interesting moving forwards, um, you know, preprints, um, De depositing your work um, into a preprint server. Uh, PLOS uh, accepts papers that have been in the preprint server and actually we, we encourage people to investigate preprint servers. By doing this, this accelerates uh, the scientific communication before, before it's published. I think we're starting to see a, a lot more open review um, and more transparency in the review process. Um, I think there's still more to, to do uh, moving beyond open data. Um, I think we talked about it earlier, ex ex uh, executing code live. Um, one interesting venture at the moment is, is Code Ocean, where you can deposit your code. Uh, Plus One encourages uh, code to be deposited in, in places such as GitHub, but the uh, Code Ocean sort of adds another layer to that, that you can run code uh, on, on the website without having to have specific uh, programs. Um, and, and continuing to think more about article level credits, uh, not just for authors, but editors. Uh, Plus One is run by academic editors and reviewers. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done, but I think we're, we're, we're starting to get there. And with that, I'd like to thank you for coming and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I'll be anticipating a result 
And then I have to submit it to uh, you for the review? Yes, yeah, so I mean, in this particular case, it's, it's, it's tied to um, the Child Tumor Foundation and, and, uh, and grants, but the general principle behind a registered report is that you submit a, a, a report before you start your work that outlines the research question that you want to address, uh, the way that you're going to address it. That gets approved and then you start your research um, following the design that you, you've done. Uh, you've, you've put in your report and then you submit it to, to the journal. So there are two review steps. So there's a review of the report um, to sort of, first of all, judge whether the methodology is suitable to, to actually answer the research question that you're asking. Um, and then the second one is, is looking at the, the, the results and the adherence to the methodology and whether your conclusions are appropriate given the results that you have. It, it depends. Um, I think in some uh, situations there is a time-bound element to it, but it obviously depends on, on the type of research that, that you're, you're doing. Uh, for, you know, for example, mouse work or any mouse work that involves uh, animals takes a lot longer than perhaps a, a, you know, for a, cell, a cell line piece of work. So it, it very much depends on the sort of um, partnership that exists um, regarding the, the registered reports. but. You know, I think generally it's sort of about two years, I, I, I think. Um, but, you know, it, it can vary. And, you know, that can also be something to, to ex explain. Different journals might have a time limit on it. Um, but, you know, if you can sort of explain, well, we, ha we had to deviate, this took a lot longer, or you know, there are all sorts of reasons why it might take longer. We do get um, some, and actually we just published a collection um, that of some of some of the null uh, results that we do get. It's definitely not the vast majority of what we publish. I think there's still a lot of work to do there to encourage people to submit uh, null results. Uh, there's a whole whole host of reasons why people don't. Um, you know, time is one. Uh, I think. Uh, you, You've got to focus on, on something else. I think also acknowledging that they're, they're as vital contribution as a positive result by funding institutions is, is also important. Um, but I think, you know, often time and, and money is, is a consideration in publishing it. But, you know, I think it's important um, in terms of saving money as well that y people know what what is working, not working, uh, that sort of thing, but it's, yeah. And I think, you know, um, initiatives like registered reports are designed to highlight the importance of it um, and to encourage people to start thinking about it. I think there's perhaps sometimes a little reluctance, you know, so you, someone might say, we do consider the negative results, but do we really? And th there might be some worry there. I mean, we would. But having that, um, in principle, acceptance, I think, can help reassure people that, that there will be consideration, fair consideration at the end of the project. But yeah, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm just thinking about the submission of scientific data. Um, <coughs> is it tentatively the case that the data is submitted along with a publication of some sort, or is there a, can you submit data without a publication? Yeah, I think you can submit. I mean, it, it depends on different disciplines, I, I think. I mean, I think GEO would accept sequencing data without having a, a publication to, to back it up. Um, and I think a lot of uh, databases would accept uh, just the raw data. I mean, in a lot of cases, people don't want to make the data available until they have the publication. Um, so that's generally what happens, but I don't think there are any restrictions in, in terms of... But you generally need to find a database that's specific to the type of data that you're generating? So there are some uh, databases, Dryad is one of them, that is, is not disciplinary specific. And I think institutional repositories also tend to 
take the, the variety of, of research data that comes out of their institutions, but then there are specific uh, repositories. And we do always encourage uh, authors that if there is a specific repository that is well accepted within your community that you use that repository, you can use it in addition to other repositories. You know, I, I alluded to uh, next generation sequencing and the, the databases at uh, NCBI are well established for that and that would be where I would look if I was looking for data. So if there, there are databases like that, we do recommend that people use those. Um, but it, it can be difficult. Some, some disciplines don't have their own repositories and so the, there are options in sort of non-specific repositories. Oh, I'm just one last <laughs> under the wire. <laughs> um, my, my own experience of creating data sets and uh, creating the repositories is that I can be No, I mean, I think that that is a, a, a very valid point. You know, there's often not a lot of metadata associated with, uh, with the research. So it, it, coming into it, it can be very difficult. And I think, you know, some databases require that. Um, already starting to put in place, you know, details about the experiment, uh, that type of thing. But it, at the moment, I think it's very repository based. And uh, at PLOS, we don't really have any guidelines on, on that type of thing. We ask that academic editors and reviewers consider whether the data is available, um, but we don't go beyond that um, to sort of... No, I mean, reviewers are available, can do that. We encourage it, but it, it, at this stage it's, it's not a requirement. Yeah. Okay, I think we should give you a voice of break. <laughs> 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 <laughs>